You know, I have always been envious of people who were certain from the time that they were young, maybe in the third grade, like the young people that we saw just a moment ago, who knew from a young age exactly what they wanted to be in life. Whether they wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor, a teacher, a firefighter, a counselor, an athlete, an artist. And then they gave everything that they have and they relentlessly pursued that dream until they achieved it. And then they spend their lives living out that vocation. The word vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, which means quite literally call. But yet, for others of us, life becomes a little more circuitous. And maybe yours has too. Even those who appear to be living with a a singular purpose, with a singular direction in life, probably live lives more circuitous than we would like, whether they appear to or not. The truth is is that our lives have been shaped and directed by multiple calls that have been placed upon our lives. This morning, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm starting a new series where over the next six weeks, we're going to look at the call stories of six biblical characters. And their responses to God's voice, to God's call in their life. And what we'll see is that God continues over and over and over again to interrupt the lives of ordinary people, people like you and people like me, to interrupt our lives, calling us, empowering us for unique and extraordinary lives, lives of service that are designed to bring hope and healing and transformation to the world. And so as we do, I hope and pray that you will see yourself in each of these characters so that you can hear and respond to that unique call that God has placed upon your life because I honestly, truly believe that God calls all of us, that God has set apart all of us in some certain way, that you'll experience the intimacy of hearing God's voice in some way, shape, or form that you'll know that you are beloved, that you're invaluable, that you have a role to play in, in bringing about God's kingdom here on earth as it already is in heaven, that you will come to see that the God of the universe, the God of Abraham and Samuel, of Mary Magdalene, that that, that same God that created them, that called them, created and called you as well and invites you to live an extraordinary life that you could never imagine on your own. And that as you'll hear and respond to God's voice in your life, that you will sense and feel God's pleasure. Answering God's call is oftentimes thrilling and exhilarating. And sometimes it is difficult and fraught with worry and fear and doesn't always seem as clear as we would like. Most who here respond uh, know that that, that it can be both, and sometimes both at the very same time. That is certainly true for Abraham, who was formerly known as Abram. God enters his life in the time of, of great uncertainty. His life, is, his life is at a crossroads. His father and his brother have died. His nephew, Lot, is now his responsibility to care for. And he and his wife, Sarai, are experiencing fertility issues. She is said to be barren, unable to conceive. And yet, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of these rugged circumstances, God sort of appears out of nowhere and places a call upon Abram's life. I want you to listen to the first four verses of that important story. This morning's reading is from Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Here begins the reading. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Here ends the reading. 
the word of God for the people of God. So I had an Old Testament professor in seminary who once said that these four verses, these four verses are sort of the linchpin of the entire Bible. Pretty big, pretty bold statement. The linchpin of the entire Bible in these four verses. Throughout Genesis, God's children continually fail to do what God has invited and called them to do. And so God chooses in this moment one person one person through whom God will enact God's purposes for the world. And God tells Abram, he says, get up and go from your country. Leave everything that you've ever known. Go to this new land, this land that I will show you. And that conversation changes the trajectory of Abram's life. And, I would argue, changes the trajectory of all of our lives. You see, the Christian family, the story of origin begins with the opening chapters in Genesis. We know the story primarily, the story of Adam and Eve, but it really starts to take off, really starts to take off with the story of Abram. The first 11 chapters of Genesis tell of God's great love for creation and of humanity's bent towards violence, towards self-destruction, self-importance, seeking power, essentially of evil. And humanity wanted to be like God. That's the story just before this, the Tower of Babel, when the people of Israel, they want to be God themselves. And then comes the story of the one, the one person who is called to journey to a new land, setting aside everything that he's ever wanted to do this for God's purposes. And God promises to bless that man with a family that will become a nation, a blessing a light to all of the other nations in the world. And that family is asked to live in such a way, to live in such a way that that they reflect God's light, that they reflect God's love, so that everyone will be drawn closer to God and to begin live once again as those created by the Lord of love. That's Abraham's story. And in many ways, it's also our story, because we too are called to live lives that reflect the light and the love of God. Now, I have become enthralled in the last couple of weeks with a new TV series called 1883. How many of you have started watching with me 1883? If you've not, I want you to get up and go home right now. No, 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 not now. (laughs) Not now, but it's on tonight. 1883. It's a little violent at times. They have some swear words. But yet, but yet, it's a fascinating story. It's a prequel to the, to the hit show Yellowstone. How many people are watching Yellowstone? A few more. Good. I'm glad to see that. The rest of you, what are you doing with your lives? <laughs> what, do you have something to do on Sunday nights? Come on. Good television. Well, the story of 1883, it begins right here in beautiful downtown Fort Worth, which in 1883 was anything but beautiful. In fact, they called it Hell's Half Acre for a reason. Fort Worth is not exactly painted with a beautiful brush in this series. But it's the story of the Dutton family as they flee poverty in Texas, and they embark on this journey towards the Great Plains, towards Oregon. They end up in Montana. We don't yet know how that diversion happens. That happens later in another episode. We'll keep to date on that as well. But they go towards this bastion of untamed America, following the dream of James Dutton, who seeks a better life for his family. As you can imagine, the terrain is difficult and rugged. Their experiences are oftentimes treacherous. They continually wonder if they have made the right decision in their search for a new homeland. Now, I suspect that in many ways that is the same sort of journey that Abram took with his family. As he just simply got up and went, as the Lord had told him, he seems to respond with a sense of blind faith. But I wonder if his faith really is all that blind, or maybe, maybe it was a little bit more informed than that. It's interesting to me that that while most of us have heard the name Abraham, 
he begins with the name Abram. Abram, which means in Hebrew, exalted father, which is ironic to me because at the beginning of the story, he is neither exalted nor a father, which leads us to ask the question about how and why and when and when that change takes place from Abram to Abraham. That's what they call a teaser to be coming up in a later episode of what happens to the life of Abraham. But more importantly, you may be extremely curious, as I was, even more so than how and why the name got changed, is to, is to why Abram just simply gets up and goes without asking a single question about where he's supposed to go, about how he's supposed to get there, how he's going to know when he arrives. Now, how many of us would have that type of faith to simply get up and go without being asked? Without asking a single question, we are asked, we are told to literally go to, go, no, go to where God only knows, literally. I would think that I would have a few questions. Now, those of us who are parents who have children know that you can't take children anywhere, regardless of their age, without a barrage of questions. Where are we going? How long will it take to get there? Who's going to be there when we arrive? How are we going to get back? Are there enough snacks? There are a barrage of questions that get asked any type of journey, but yet here in this moment. And so it got me wondering, maybe that's why God chose the 75-year-old Abram, because he knew that he would not get hit with a barrage of questions. At first, it appears that he is wandering on a blind faith, but a closer look at these four linchpin verses, it seems that there is something in it for Abram if he will only be obedient to God's call. You see, Abram will become a great nation. He'll be blessed, meaning, meaning he'll be blessed with descendants who will become politically powerful. They will control land. Abram will become a, a household name. He'll become famous. He may even live up to the exalted father name. But even more importantly, at that time, the one who will be blessed will become a blessing to all the people on earth. And the really good news in all of this, the really good news is that Abram doesn't have to do it himself. He is not responsible for making any of it happen. God, we are told, is going to make everything happen. The great nation, the great name, the blessings, Abram's positive influence on the world, all of it, God will have a hand. God will be responsible for making all that happen if only he will be obedient and so if we continue to read on in the story, Abram steps out in the not-so-blind faith as God told him to go to the land of Canaan. And as they traveled through this rugged terrain, they stop in a place called Shechem. And there, in response to God's obedience, God reinforces the promises that were uttered earlier, this time giving them a little bit more color, giving them a little bit more texture. In the story, we see God standing in the shade of a big tree, a tree called the Oak of Mora, and he's wiping the sweat from his brow, and he's looking out across this mountainous region, taking in the glorious view. And God interrupts this moment of silence and solitude as he looks at the scenery and says, to your offspring, to your offspring, I will give this land. You see, God shifts from instructing Abram to go towards the land to showing and promising him that this is the land, and that all that his eyes can take in, that one day will belong to all of Abram's offspring. The one who is childless at the age of 75 will have children whose children will, will not just pitch tents in this land as his aliens, but they will possess it. It will be their home. Now, it must have been difficult, obviously, for Abram and Sarah and Lot to be displaced from that which is familiar in their lives, to strike out, strike out with a new place without a sense of, of purpose, without a clear roadmap, without any roadmap at all. And so I'm wondering if that's ever happened to you, if you've ever made a journey like that, if you've ever uh, left family or friends, maybe, maybe it's to go off to college. 
Maybe it's to begin a new job in a new town. Maybe even a new part of country. Heck, maybe even a new country. And you left everything that was familiar, everything that was comfortable, and leaving all that is familiar. You probably pursued that journey out of a hope for a better tomorrow, for a more successful life. And while you may have known some of what to expect in your new surroundings, your entire path was not entirely clear and laid out as possible, as clearly and as possibly as you would want. And you probably felt a sense of vulnerability. You probably felt a little lonely, afraid, curious, afraid of the unknown. But along the way, there were some assurances that began to replace the void of the unknown. And you made some new friends. And you discovered things like Tex-Mex and queso, Texas barbecue. You began to not just adapt, but appreciate your new surroundings. And along the way, that confidence that confidence that maybe you took the right path was being reinforced, oftentimes in small, almost incremental ways. Well, that same thing happens to Abram and Sarah, and while it's difficult to leave behind the security and the comfort of everything they've ever known, along the way, God, God brings this good news, this, this promise for them and for the generations to come. This new homeland, there's going to be a new life, he says, and their obedience to God's call opens up new and promising future, one, one that is beyond their wildest imaginations, better than they could ever dream and ask for themselves. You see, for Abram and Sarai, listening to and obeying God's call is the vital linchpin to an unimaginable future, and I would argue that the same is true for us as well. Now, there were times, don't get me wrong, when Abram was probably exhausted and stressed and, and wondering if he had made a terrible mistake, or even worse, or even worse, wondering if God had made a mistake. There's one thing to make a, self, a mistake ourselves, but another to wonder if God made the mistake in choosing us, sending us. But yet God continued to show up and encouraging him not to call it quits. At one point, at one point, God says, don't be afraid, Abram, don't be afraid. I will protect you. I will be your shield. Your reward will be great, I promise, God says. And at one of these points when Abram is growing discouraged, and he asks God, you know, I'm doing as I've been told, and yet here I am all these years later, and the one thing that I wanted, the one thing that I wanted, the one thing that I ever wanted in life was to be a father, to be an exalted father. Will I ever have children? What are you going to give me? What is going to be my reward for my obedience all of my life long? And God says, Abram, look up. Look up, Abram, look up at the stars. Do you see all of those stars? All of the stars, that is how numerous your descendants will be, so much so that you won't even be able to count them. Now, it's important to remember that that didn't happen right away. In fact, that happened 24 years after Abram first answered God's call. In light of his obedience, in light of his faithfulness, Abram, this exalted father, is given a new name. Abraham, which means in Hebrew, father of multitudes. And Sarai, beautiful Sarai, who's 90 years old, is given a new name too. Her name is Princess, a 90-year-old princess. And she is told, she is told, this old and barren woman, that she will give rise to nations and kings through the birth of their son Isaac. Now Isaac, this is my favorite part of the entire story, Isaac is a word that means in Hebrew, laughter. Because when these people in their 90s are told they're going to be parents, there was laughter. You see, Abram, while not always trusting what God has promised, he remains faithful to God's call. 
comes to learn that he can indeed trust God with his life, with the life of his son, and with the destiny of all of the sons and daughters that would be born to future generations. I'm wondering if there's ever been times in your life where you have both at the same time, both doubted while still holding on to the promise, that you've ever wondered if you could trust while still being obedient. I'm also wondering if there have been times in your life when things have taken a little longer than you would have liked. That it's taken a little longer than you imagined. That it's still taking a little longer for your vision to come into focus. If so, you are a son and daughter of Abraham. Several years ago at my last church, I was leading a Bible study, and we were studying and we were reading about the will of God. We were doing a Bible study while also reading Leslie Weatherhead's book. And there was a wise person in that congregation who'd been around the block a time or two. She was a little long in the tooth. And she simply said, you know, if we think we know with certainty where we will be or what we will be doing in the next five years, we probably aren't walking within the will of God. But, she said, when we prayerfully take one uncertain step at a time, we are probably going exactly where God is leading us. You see, church, you, you are a beloved child of God. You are a descendant of Abraham. You are set apart for great purposes. You are blessed in order to be a blessing to others, to show the world the depth of God's love, not just for you, but for all people. And so may you listen for the voice of God who wants to lead you to the place where God has set apart for you, that God will show you if only you will trust God to, step, to lead you step by step by step into a bright and unimaginable future.